It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to. Lots to talk about Easter morning. Oh, well, Donald Trump had a little had a little fit. 71 social media posts on his on his truth social. Uh, one of them, actually, one of them uh, did reference Easter. Uh, simply posted Happy Easter. Uh, the rest of them. <laughs> wow. The crazy. Oh, my goodness. The crazy. Uh, one of them, he actually claimed that he was the chosen one. Sent by God and blessed by God. You know, it's his divine right to be president. Uh, the rest of it was just whining, complaining. Um, what do you expect? You know, you're, you're, you're taking his, 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 his fits of anger out on you know, Jack Smith and all of the people that he believes have slighted him. He believes have done him wrong. Yeah, yeah. Crazy, crazy stuff. And oh, Tommy Tuberville had a good Easter message as well. Uh, he said that Democrats were a satanic cult. Uh, so that was his Easter message. And <laughs> uh, would you expect nothing else from the dumbest guy in the U.S. Senate? Uh, but uh, this is the thing. I, I remember, you know, and I said this on, on the program yesterday, that as I'm watching all these these truth posts come out, and I'm laughing because at this point it's comical that you have a guy who is a heart, is potentially the next president of the United States um, having a temper tantrum like a child in public, in all caps, fortunately on a social media platform that very few people use, and is now the front and center, the heart of a new pump and dump. Um, because we find out on Monday, shocker of all shockers, uh, that the, 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 the guy who, the Mr. Art of the Deal, you know, the very best deal guy, um, not such a good deal. In fact, pretty crummy deal. In fact, really, really bad. And again, we've known this from uh, the vodka to the Trump University to the stakes to the airlines to every other con and grift uh, that he could possibly imagine to fleece people out of money and then, you know, walk away holding, letting everyone else hold the bag. Are you surprised that Truth Social is uh, the next in a line of, I'm sure, what will be not the last, but uh, a line of cons? Uh, because we find out on Monday that his his social media company lost fifty eight million dollars in twenty twenty three, and and here's the kicker: this is the part you go. Well, you know, had a lot of expenses. They only brought in four point one million dollars in revenue in twenty twenty three. So they again, Mister Art of the Deal, Mister I Know Business. I'm I'm the best. I'm the greatest businessman. Everyone loves my business. Um. If you're running a business and you're spending, what, $62 million and only bringing in four, um, <laughs> I think there's a problem. Uh, there is a massive disconnect of, of where we are, and which is why I think the, the, the stories so far have been, uh, congratulations, you know, the flock probably fleeced again. All of those cultists who said, oh, we're going to invest in Truth Social. Uh, they're probably going to lose their you-know-whats. Because I think every person that I've talked to who knows anything about, about Wall Street or investing looks at this company and goes, how um, people bought into this beyond, beyond them? Uh, expect this stock to plunge. In fact, uh, the accounting firm... This is the part that just blows my mind. The accounting firm that, that Trump uses for his media company is going, mm, don't think you're going to make it. <laughs> I think we're, again, Mr. Bankruptcy, maybe going to bankrupt another company. And and you go, for, for what aim? Well, clearly to try and line his pockets. Uh, clearly to try and, well, do more of what he does really well. Fleecing the faithful. And... And, and I, I ask myself, 
Could this be the Waterloo? Could this be the final straw where people go, no, we we thought Truth Social was making all this money. We thought there were, they had a lot of a lot of users. They don't. Turns out everything is in the toilet. Users are down, losing money. It it's again, I'm not a Wall Street investor, but I am smart enough to go, I don't know that I want to buy into a, a sinking ship. The Titanic of social media. Uh, right here. Now, one of the arguments that I read that you have to be concerned about, and this is a political year, and you have to talk about the political ramifications of you now have Trump who has this, 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 what is going to be a failing company. The only way this company turns around is if uh, what we're seeing right before our very eyes is that this is a giant bribery scam. And the argument of, hey, you know, this could be, if he becomes president and is commander in chief, this could, quite frankly, give foreign or even domestic interests a, a way to pressure Trump, a way to sway his his views to one way or another. Uh, hey, you know, I'll bail out your company if you. You know, whatever. And uh, you have to wonder, is this what you want? Now, I've been saying for a long time, I think Trump, all of his businesses are set up to do one thing, and that's make Trump a whole bunch of money. Uh, not you, not me, not, not, not the good of the public, none of those high-minded community kind of, uh, kind of charter ideas of the beginning of the country. But hey, more for him. And leave everyone holding the bag. Remember, it's a guy who bankrupt a casino, a place where generally you you could print money. I'm looking at this, and I got a I got a question. When will we wake up? Now, here's where my faith is. Uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission is watching. So, you know, this could be, and, and I, I ran this past a red hat who, who, who lost his mind. I said, you know, what do you think if, uh, if it turns out to be just they threw this out here in the hopes of, of cashing in on the IPO and, and letting it tank, could you see another criminal indictment coming? Could you see the SEC going after him for securities fraud, for whatever? Because clearly... Um, there's nothing here. Uh, and if Trump were to leave that platform, it would collapse entirely. The only reason that most people tune into it, the only reason that I look at it is I want to see what kind of insanity uh, Trump is going to going to relay. I want to see when he has a 71 tweet or 71 truth day or 71 post day, what kind of insanity is next? Because as I said at the beginning, I'm watching all of this flurry of crazy coming out going, wonder what's coming out tomorrow. I wonder what bad news. Is there an indictment that I don't know about? Is there bad news somewhere that he just got, knows is coming, and now needs to provide ground cover? Because that's what this is. And generally our media, generally our media, the lapdogs there follow right along. Oh, he said crazy stuff. Let's talk about crazy stuff and not talk about the fact that, yeah, uh, bad news. This, this very different. Uh, so when we come back, uh, I'm going to spend a little time uh, figuring out, you know, how is this going to, how is this going to play out? Get some questions answered on where we should be looking, what it is I might be missing and well, uh, any accountability. So when we come back, Bartlett Collins Naylor is going to be here from Public Citizen to share some thoughts on just how, how, how what we don't know. Uh, maybe answer some of my questions and help me figure out, uh, well, could we see another indictment back after this?
We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors, the American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk. So I'll tell you, on Easter, I spent the day watching, uh, among other things, you know, you had your family things. But, you know, on Truth Social, I'm watching Trump just lose his mind uh, on, you know, as we talked about, lose his mind on the uh, on the truths there, uh, 71 of them. Called himself the chosen one. Lots of lots of stuff. Lots of, you know, uh, sent me the message that, you know, something bad. Something bad was going to happen on Monday. And, well, we find on Monday that uh, Truth Social lost $58 million in 2023 and, and just had $4.1 million in revenue. Now, this thing... When they did this 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 IPO thing, when they they opened it up for all of the the flock to come to, something like seven billion dollars, uh, they got on a company that doesn't appear to be worth, I don't know, seven cents. Uh, that's why I've asked Bartlett Collins uh, to come talk with us. Barton Collins Naylor is an expert on corporate governance, financial markets, and shareholder policy rights. He's a financial policy advocate over at Public Citizen, citizen.org, their website. Bartlett, thanks for taking time for us. Thank you for having me. So have I laid this out right? I'm, the story I'm getting, um, we're now finding out that the company that supposedly is worth $7 billion got, gave Trump a three, almost $4 billion windfall, only made $4.1 million in revenue last year that, while losing $58 million? That's right. A, a company with those kind of revenue and profit slash loss numbers should be worth nothing. A, a point of clarification, when this company had its initial public offering, it's not that $8 billion went into the company or $5 billion went into the company. Uh, a number of millions of dollars of investor money went into the company and at a certain price, if you were to say, well, if there's 10 shares and they're selling for $10 a share, um, that values the company at $100. Right. But if there's another thousand shares, that values the company at more, even though the money isn't there. So, so for example, on a cryptocurrency, if I have a token and I, and I have a million tokens and I sell you one for a for dollar and you sell it to your friend for $10, times the million tokens suddenly the market capitalization of that cryptocurrency is up into the billions when really only eleven dollars has changed hands so this eight billion dollar valuation is not a um, truckload of cash that has gone into the company it's a far lower number and it just happens that trump has 60 or 58 percent of the shares and were he to be able to unload it of people buying it, then technically that's what it would be worth. Although as we, we can get into, anytime you sell, then the price is, is unlikely to, when there's a lot of selling pressure, uh, the price is unlikely to be sustained at that higher level. Well, of course, but you know, it, it immediately when this happened, you know, it was my opinion that this was going to be the great con because I don't know very many people on Truth Social. I don't see uh, them competing at all with Twitter or even Gab for that matter. So the fact that the, this was going to happen and all this money was going to flow into these people buying these shares, 
as an outsider, as someone purely who's a, a spectator in what happens on Wall Street, my thought is, could this be the greatest con ever that Trump Trump pulls off? Could this be a way for the Saudis or the you know the Russian oligarchs or whomever uh, to funnel money to Trump right before our very eyes to pay his legal bills and all the other stuff? Uh, any of that ring a bell, ring ring with well, you? Well, I've had some wild thoughts that how many Americans are willing to pay $50 a share for something that's really worth nothing? <laughs> and it, are they so generous as to basically do that? In other words, if, if, if you were to say, you know, this person is a great guy, I'm just going to send him a gift of $50. Um, and this is a, a way to do that. Could the Saudis, could the Russians do that? I, I suppose they could. Um, and you would say, well, there's reputational harm, but I think we're well beyond <laughs> beyond the problem of reputational harm. Um, that said, uh, it just seems extraordinary. L let me jump in and say, this is the most shorted stock on Wall Street right now. And by that, I mean, these are people who are making bets that the company will go down. And with such a relatively thin market capitalization now compared to the you know giants like Apple and Google, uh, that's saying something that, that there there are already people lined up betting that this stock will decline. And I, I got to imagine Trump's got to be one of them. And and how ironic that would be. That would be ironic. I, I I'm not sure that he's allowed to short his own stock, but. Uh, that's a question that I'll have to research. I wonder what the kids are doing because you know, look, I look at this and and I'm with you. I when this first happened, I said, you know, uh, you know, working people may because they believe in him. They bought the red hat, uh, they got the T-shirt, they got the flags, they're buying the Bible, uh, they're doing all this stuff that he's he's throwing out there because well, they're they're in the cult. Uh, that this is one more of those things, and you know, as I was thinking about it, because you know, as this pops up. You know, could this, in my mind, could this be the, the last great con where people finally wake up and go, holy, holy, you know what? There's there's literally nothing here. I, I think that's right. So if my understanding of how the gravitational forces work on Wall Street over the course of the next two or three months, this stock will decline basically to where it should be, which is, is nothing. So that when Trump's restricted period ends, uh, there won't be much to sell. Now, uh, as you know, the board could waive those restrictions on when he, when he would start to sell. Um, uh, you know, the, that wouldn't be a good sign either. But noticing that short selling, that stock mark, the stock is already down 20 some percent today, suggests there is, a, there is no um, floor, there, there is no, um, basic level of Trump investors hungry to gobble this stock up at at, uh, at any price. Apparently, there is a limit, and the short selling presumably is having an impact on the decline in this price. So, so let me ask you this: you know, from from the IPO to this moment, where it, it's clearly going down, and I and I agree, uh, I, and I agree with a lot of the commentators I've seen that this is going to tank further. Um, you know, what does he get out of this? I mean, d did he make money off the original? Uh, IPO is he going to be able to make the four billion dollars that they claimed? You know what? What tanking this does he get out of this? I guess I don't question. think he's been, been able to put any money into his pocket yet. That that is when he is allowed to sell his stock, and then that depends on the on the stock price. So that that's months away. Again, unless he gets a waiver from his board, which includes people that work for him or um, he is the parent of. So, so maybe, uh, and you could dump this, this, this pig on someone else. So the question I, I then have when, when you look at this going it on paper, you know, given this report and I'm sure more will come out, uh, I look at this, this sentence of this Sam Bankman Freed, um, who got 25 years for fraud. I, you know, I'm kind of going, look, not a wall, not a wall street guy, not a lawyer, but one guy gets thrown in jail for 25 years for fraud. Another guy's got a giant, you know, chocolate covered turd uh, that you know, you're trying to bank off on, on folks. What, what's the difference? The difference, I think, is that Sam Bankman Freed lied. He said that put your money in this exchange and we'll keep it there. And he and he, in fact, took eight or more billion dollars and shipped it over to his hedge fund where they made bets. 
or shipped it off to members of Congress in political contributions or to Tom Brady and other sports figures. So he didn't tell the truth. In this case, Donald Trump is telling the truth. He says, I've got a business. It loses a lot of money. Now, please invest in it. Okay. No, no, and, and I'm glad you clarified that because that, that was a question that was banging around in my head. Uh, so this is just the Trump brand going, hey, this is what we do. Because clearly this is another in a long line of products and things that he's brought to the market that have, well, failed. And one nice thing about, um, about a stock as overseen by the Securities and Exchange Commission is that they do have to be candid in their disclosures. So if he's going to sell you a degree from Trump University or a juicy steak from Trump steak, he can embellish a good deal, but he can't really embellish um, or the company can't embellish in their securities and exchange um, disclosures. And it is a, an enjoyable read. You know, um, one of our principal owners uh, faces uh, 91 indictments. That's that's part of the, uh, the risk that you have to read about when you, um, are investing in this should you care to read these uh, disclosures now i keep seeing that this is like the the, the big meme stock uh, what does that mean i think that um is a trope that comes from an experience with GameStop about two or so years ago when a bunch of gamers decided that the storefront that sold video games might have a life despite, despite other people saying, hey, you know, nobody buys anything from a, a, a bricks and mortar storefront anymore. You buy all these games online where they arrive, they arrive in the mail. And so a number of people uh, rallied around uh, various social media forums and kept buying the stock. And it led to what's known as a short squeeze when you, are short when you are betting something is going to decline in value um mechanically what happens is you borrow shares from somebody that owns them then you sell it at a price i'll say ten dollars a share because you figure that the price is going to go down to two dollars a share whereupon you buy it for two dollars a share you have the stock and you give it back to the guy that lent it to you when it was selling for ten dollars a share if, however, this stock goes from $10 to $15, you have to either pay um, some interest on that to make sure you're not going to run away, or you have to cover your short by buying it at $15 a share. And so um, once the stock kept going up, in this case GameStop, it, um, it, it, uh, with, with so many retail investors involved in it, it led to a short squeeze. and. Uh, some people say that it was the little guy taking revenge on the big, the big guys on Wall Street, and certainly some big guys on Wall Street did lose money. Yeah, is is there any possible this that this becomes uh, something in that world? Because I had someone explain try and explain it to me, and I'm look again not a Wall Street guy, but that this could be like the red hat revenge. Like this could be the ground where they go, no, we're going to defend our guy, even if it is a giant chocolate covered turd. Uh, we're we're sticking with him. Well, you, you'll have to have people, if at current prices, are willing to collectively spend 5 or $8 billion. And for context, those who are uh, supportive of Trump the candidate are not making those contributions to his campaign. They're not in the, the billions of dollars. Those are in the millions of dollars. So if you truly believe in this candidate, you would imagine that you would invest with your political contribution. And so far, that's not even in the same order of magnitude as what the stock market valuation is. Though, again, as we discussed, market capitalization is a different figure than actual money invested. Interesting. So uh, as of this moment, as of we know right now, uh, there, there's no Saudi prince coming in to, to bail the, to come bail them out. There's, there's, there's none of that going on that we know of. Not that I know, but I think uh, you, I, and a whole bunch of other people are are on the alert for that, um, for a, another way of basically saying, uh, you want to sell me a beanie baby? Here, I will give you an ungodly amount of money for it. I mean, Trump Trump did try to sell NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Yeah, yeah. Um, and again, he couldn't find enough fools to, uh, to make 
to make him a multi-billion dollar payday off that. Apparently, right. some some people realize what thin air is. But I, I do know a couple people who did. I mean, so there are, unfortunately, there are, well, what's that thing? There's a sucker born every minute? And Trump's figured out a way to get at least some of them to line his pockets. It, it would appear. Amazing stuff. Uh, but uh, this is just, there's so much here. Is there anything I'm missing? Anything that you go... Uh, hey, you forgot something because this is, uh, again, this is a world that I'm not, you know, uh, in in depth in. Uh, is there something that, that maybe we're missing that I, I should be aware of as well? Uh, well, I was intrigued at some of the accounting that led this company that had less revenue in 2022 than it did in 2023 and yet reported a profit. So I'm a little concerned that accounting shenanigans uh, – God forbid that that would ever take place in a Trump business. But some accounting shenanigans um, might might be at play. But again, I I think this company um, loses a lot of money on very little revenue, and an investor uh, can't count on this company sustaining a five or seven or nine billion dollar valuation. Last question I've got for you, because you you opened the door here uh, with accounting irreg potential irregularities. Uh, and I guess this is a you know, look into your crystal ball. Do we do we expect maybe someone? Because it seems to me every time Trump gets involved in one of these, someone uh, gets into legal trouble. Generally not him, uh, but someone gets thrown under the bus. Any any prediction on on how many or if there will be people who see uh, you know legal action? Yeah, it's it's a good question. I think if you did have one of these nefarious investors coming to bail them out, that would be a problem. So, for example, even though some of these uh, foreign funds, uh, you could argue, are led by single individuals, some of them do have fiduciary responsibilities. So, literally handing over a gift is something that uh, that could be problematic, even in um, uh, countries without a, a full-throated democracies. Right. Um, and I would again um, laud the Securities and Exchange Commission and the regime under which this is happening. Um, the 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 reason a public company is generally so well regarded is that it has a universe of people watching it. it investors have have money in it as a public company. A private a private company is obviously not subject to that same public scrutiny. Hence, a lot of the things that have gone on in the past with this person and the people that have gone to jail um, uh, um, were not subjected to that public scrutiny. Got it. Uh, <clears throat> well, we'll see where this takes us. But Bartlett, I appreciate you taking some time for us, sharing your expertise. Uh, I'm sure this will come up again. So I'd love to have you back again as this uh, this continues down the road. Thanks for your interest. Thanks so much, Bartlett Collins Naylor, expert on go corporate governance, financial markets, and shareholder rights. Uh, there with the Financial Policy uh, Advocate Group, Congress Watch, uh, Public Citizen is where they're at, citizen.org, their website. Uh, we'll get links out on social media. You can take a look at that. I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, you throwing fifty bucks in? You, you uh, do you know any red hats who are going to the going to the rescue? I want to hear it. Email me, Rick at the Rick Smith Show .com. Right back. Thanks for tuning in to The Rick Smith Show. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Rick Smith Show. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Welcome back to The Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So, California Governor Gavin Newsom had an interesting tweet the other day that caught my attention. Again, something we've talked about uh, here on the program, but he tweeted out, here's your reminder that these three... Uh, he's talking about, you know, President Obama, President Clinton and President Biden, uh, that these three have created 49 million out of the 51 million jobs in America since 1989. Ninety six percent of all jobs for the last 35 years, he writes, created by Democratic presidents. And and you, you go, you know, when you look at the numbers, completely accurate. And the fact that Republicans even whisper the Reagan question of, are you better off now than you were four years ago, is stunning, given the fact that four years ago, we had morgue trucks parked in front of hospitals. The economy was shut down. Supermarket shelves were barren. Unemployment near record highs. So why? Why is Biden not getting the credit, well, one would expect for cleaning up 
a massive mess from a once in a hundred year pandemic? Well, here to help answer part of that question, I've asked Zach Carter to come talk with us. Zach is a uh, contributor over at Slate.com. He's also an author of the book, The Price of Peace, Money, Democracy, and the Life of John Maynard Keynes. Zachary, thanks for taking time for us. Thanks for having me, Rick. So what do you make of this? I mean, you know, I, I think I laid it out four years ago. The economy was shut down. We were locked in our homes. The shelves were barren. Things were not good. Not a, not, a, not a period in time I would pine to return to. And yet here we are, record on, near record unemployment. Uh, all of the communities that normally don't participate in, in, in good times doing really well. A stock market all-time highs, all this stuff. Why not even just a little credit? It is remarkable how dour the sentiment is given the strength of the economy by just about every metric that economists follow um, by historical standards. Uh, it's just very hard to find another economy that compares favorably to this one in the last 50 years. Um, you know, you can, if you, if you go back far enough, you can start pulling statistics here and there. Uh, but we haven't had the unemployment rate this low for this long, literally in over 50 years. Uh, it's below 4% now. It's been below for 4% for I, month, several months, maybe even a year now. Um, and despite the surge of inflation after the pandemic, uh, wages are up. Uh, even accounting for inflation, wages for the typical American worker are up, and they are up quite a bit for workers at the bottom end of the income ladder. I think the the sort of harshest thing you can say about the Biden administration's recovery is that some of the best things they did, uh, did just didn't continue. I mean, there are things like uh, the child oh, tax credit cool. expansion that he, he did early in, uh, in his administration, which was really helpful for a lot of families, um, but that expired. Um, so, you know, would it be better if that had continued? I think, I think the answer is yes. Uh, is it bad that it happened no <laughs> you have you have all these families who are just much better off than they would have been otherwise and i think aside from the the story of uh, that the numbers tell which is that we're living through one of the strongest economies in decades uh you have you have a story about the government actually being effective here uh you know the the jobs created after the 2008 financial crisis were bad jobs the majority of those jobs were poverty jobs you did not see wage growth after the 2008 uh, financial crisis. And that was, I, I think the Biden administration looked at the George W. Bush and Barack Obama uh, administration's approach to that calamity and said, there's something to be learned from this. We can do better than that recovery. And in fact, if we don't do better than we did in that recovery, then American democracy might not make it. Um, I, I, myself, I look back at that recovery. I, recovery is such a, such a you know, it's a terrible word to use for that period. I mean, the Great Recession is a better a better description. Um, the reason you had no wage rope is because the labor market was terrible. Yep. You had 10% unemployment. Um, you know, the unemployment hit 10% before the uh, 2010 election and stayed there for two years. Uh, it didn't say at 10%, it stayed above 9% for two years. Um, the, the unemployment rate began falling during during the Trump years, frankly, because we spent so much during the Trump years, and because Biden then spent $1.9 trillion out of the gate just to make sure that jobs were there. I mean, that money got spent on workers. Um, it, it, it also got spent on corporations so they could hire workers. Uh, and then the money kept coming. I mean, it was another re-up with an infrastructure bill and then another re-up with the CHIPS Act to, to supply uh, basically subsidies for companies to build, uh, to build microchip factories in the United States. And then with the Inflation Reduction Act, which is kind of a cute name, but it's basically a manufacturing bill for green manufacturing, where there's a ton of subsidies being paid to companies if they will build factories here in the United States. And those that's that's all happening. Um, so, so why don't we hear that? I mean, this is, this is the part. You know, why, aren't, <laughs> why aren't we hearing all of this good news? I mean, we talk about it here on the program all the time. Uh, I keep saying, look, the, an industrial policy? Yes, please. Been begging for that for decades. Uh, the idea of the jobs that are created out of the money that we invest in infrastructure and, and bringing back manufacturing and all this other stuff should be good union jobs that people can live on. More of that, please. How come we're not hearing enough of that? I think there are two complementary problems here. Uh, the first is that this type of policy that the Biden administration pursues um, is offensive to a certain brand of economist who's really steeped in the kind of econ 101 supply and demand naturally meet their 
equilibrium stuff that everybody learns in their, uh, their, yeah, you, their mean, first... you mean the people who got us into the mess that we're in uh, because you know I look the economy was not great before the pandemic the fact that we're inching up a little bit is good but still not great I mean we're still decades behind where we should have been had it not been for the Reagan era bad policies and what Clinton continued so for me you know good things are getting better that's fabulous but we're decades behind what my grandparents generation were able to do there is an enormous adjustment that has to be made. And I think to some extent, uh, and I think to a, uh, to a greater extent than I expected, uh, the Biden administration has shown a willingness to make that, uh, that adjustment. I mean, I, I think the belief that um, manufacturing jobs aren't just gonna pop up um, or that it's good that they disappear because better jobs will take their place. I mean, that clearly just hasn't been shown um, to be true, and I think that's that, that was part of the uh, the unrest that led to Trump being elected in 2016. These these things are all multifaceted and have different causes, um, but I think that's clearly part of the story here. And uh, and I think the Biden administration wanted to learn from that and say, okay, well that's not a way to run an economy. Um, and they've done, I think, an admirable job. But I I do think that this this <laughs> This insistence on on believing the things that people uh, are taught in Econ 101, which, by the way, to be fair to economists, the rest of the economics profession is about unlearning <laughs> Econ 101 and explaining why that's not that stuff isn't true. But it often doesn't make its way into policy, um, and uh, and and I I think I think a lot of economists who are upset about the amount of spending that was going on and and in particular and then became even more upset about the attempt to sort of interfere with uh, the natural flow of international free trade by, by you know, explicitly creating domestic subsidies for companies that build things in the United States. Um, I think that was very offensive to a certain kind of economist. And that economist typically occupies the center uh, or the center right of the American ideological spectrum. And they have a lot of influence within the Democratic Party establishment. And I think a lot of these intuitions about Econ 101 are very dominant in a lot of uh, you know the, the higher paid prof uh, echelons of, of what remains of the American media landscape. So I think you ended up with a lot of the center saying, we don't believe in this policy. Uh, and then when inflation came, because uh, we, we did see uh, you know, a, a rough run of inflation there for, uh, for about a year, um, the progressive wing of the party didn't wanna take credit for the labor market. They, they, everybody was angry about inflation. So people said, well, I'm, I don't really have much to say about this right now. <laughs> Uh, no, and, you're right. And, and, you're right. I mean, there's and this is what Democrats do. It's the same thing they did with the Affordable Care Act. They run away from their accomplishments, as whereas Republicans, even if it's bad, they are literally coming out, Zachary, and saying, are you better off today than you were four yeah. years ago? Yeah. And there is nobody I have found no one who goes, yeah, I was much better off four years ago. Well, that's not true. Um, you know, my son was happier because he was able to sit on the couch and watch TV, didn't have to go to school. There's one person, but for everybody else, four years ago was misery. It was brutal. Um, and and there's there was no guarantee that the economy was going to bounce back from that. I think also within the economics profession, there's this view that things just kind of work themselves out in a market economy. And when you have a big disaster like the COVID crash, if you just step back and wait for the economy to fix itself, it will. Uh, and I don't Will think it? that's true. <laughs> yeah. well, no, uh, but I, here's the thing. This is where maybe it, it does it does work itself out the way it's supposed to in their view. Uh, the wealthy get wealthier uh, because as we've seen from the beginning of the pandemic until just recently, a study was out. Uh, the wealthier got 88 percent wealthier. Our billionaires got 88 percent wealthier over the pandemic, while the rest of us, well, uh, I got fourteen hundred bucks from Joe Biden. Uh, I think we got six hundred from from Trump, and and I forget what the first one was, but I got a couple hundred bucks back. So, I I guess that that evens out, right? I don't know. I mean, I I think the um, I think even the wealthy can end up doing very badly if the government doesn't take action to support the economy. I mean, during the Great Depression, um, rich people did really well once the New Deal spending kicked in. It was actually really bad for like. <laughs> the J.P. Morgan Chase made a lot more money after it was, it wasn't called J.P. Morgan Chase then, but J.P. Morgan made a lot more money after it was broken up in, uh, in, by, by the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933. Um, that required those banks to split into smaller pieces. The bankers themselves were furious about this policy, uh, but it turned out that splitting this company into multiple companies 
they had more business. And because there was more spending going into the economy, there were more deals to do. And so these companies ended up making a lot more money, even though uh, the government was meddling in the economy and, and spending a lot of money on, on working people. So I, I, I think to some extent, um, it can be true that the rich do well when the economy suffers, but it can also just be the rich uh, are padded from the, uh, the, the, the suffering in a way that makes it seem like they're doing better um, then you know actually their actually their fortunes are declining um, in this particular um, recovery. I mean, one of the reasons rich people saw uh, this extraordinary run up in their fortunes was because the government was backstopping um, financial losses. So we didn't have a banking crash, and stock market valuations went through the roof. So if you don't participate in the stock market, you don't get to participate in those gains. Right. Uh, I think there was a concern, and I think it was justifiable that if you let the bottom drop out of the financial wing of the economy during this, uh, I mean, the COVID crash is different from the financial market crash of, of, of 2008 and that it wasn't a financial crash. It was a direct attack on industry itself. Um, so if you, if you add a financial crash to the industrial fallout uh, that was, was occurring, um, you would have had a, a multi-generational, you know, a generational catastrophe. It, it already was, you know, the worst economic crash of our lifetimes, but you could have seen this thing drag out and 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 get get so much worse. And I think there is a there is a sort of um, there's a progressive frustration that that um, that things seem to go well for rich people all the time. I mean, that's why they're rich. That's what it means to be rich is things go well for you um, and that uh, everybody else has to sort of wait for a crisis um, to maybe get maybe see a little bit of 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 progress. That is a reality. It's I, I understand the frustration. But in this particular crash, there was more money spent directly on working people than in 2008, than after 1992, than after any recession since the Great Depression. No, um, no, absolutely. The, I, have, the, I completely the, agree. The $1,400 checks that you're talking about from Joe Biden, that was real. But the expansion of the child tax credit was even bigger. Uh, and the expansion of unemployment benefits that began under Trump and continued into 2022, I believe, um, was a, a really remarkable um, safety net for people. And it, you know, you can talk to people who benefited from that. I mean, people who lost their jobs who ended up making more money over the course of you know nine or ten months when there was no work to be found, who could have you know spend that time raising their kids, developing a new interest or a new hobby, um, just having a life where there might not have been one otherwise. <laughs> and uh, I, I think that was a um, that spending was a product of uh, a lesson learned from from how not to do crisis recovery in 2008. And uh, I, I think in general, uh, there, it, it combined with the, the center's disbelief that the government can do things that are actually productive for people's lives. I think there is kind of a, a progressive nihilism that has been uh, or a nihilism that's been built into the progressive movement since the Obama years that says, you know, that just doesn't believe that the government will do things that benefit them, even when they are doing it, even when the government really is doing it. It's, it, you know, the, the Great Recession was so damaging for the psyche of American workers and American families that people just uh, have a hard time believing that the system couldn't possibly be anything but always rigged against them. Yeah, um, but you also throw into that, you know, you know 40 years of of, of conservative messaging telling you government can't do anything and shouldn't do anything and we need to leave everything to the invisible hand uh, because it's the natural state of things. Um, yeah, that plays into this as well. So you have, look, I think you have a lot of people on both sides uh, not believing that government action can make lives better as where I believe it does. You know, I, I, I think there's, um, there's sort of a... Uh, a funny critique that has emerged about uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS Act, um, that it, it, I understand the critique from the centrist position. People say this is wasteful spending, this is interfering with international trade. Um, I, I, I understand where they're coming from. I don't, I don't think that's a, a valid, I don't think that's true, but I understand what they're saying. There's sort of a left-wing version of that critique, which is this stuff is all corporate welfare. These are subsidies that are going to profitable corporations that don't need the money and workers are being left out in the cold. And uh, ultimately, they're saying the same thing. They're saying this is wasteful spending that doesn't benefit working people. And I think folks on the left and folks from the progressive movement and folks in the, in, in the labor movement should take a real hard look at that, that argument and ask if, we really, if it's really true that we're not seeing better jobs 
and better wages as a result of those uh, investments that are being made. See, as a labor um, person, and I, and I can only speak for myself, uh, I'm in favor of, of in investing and, and you know building the future. But if a company's profitable, at the bargaining table, I want better wages, hours, and conditions. Uh, so if they're doing better, we should be doing better as well. I don't care how they got better, uh, but there has to be that, that trickle down we were promised that for decades hasn't happened. And I think tighter labor markets make it easier for unions to make that pitch or to make to to to, to land that that. that and plane. also, you know, having uh, laws in place that that help with collective bargaining, which have been under assault for the last 40, 50 years. And I think one of the best things that the Biden administration has done is appoint an extremely competent uh, and knowledgeable team to the National Labor Relations Yeah, Board, yeah. No, I, is, I tell all my union is, friends, uh, Jennifer Abruzio is the reason you vote for Joe Biden. You, if you need no other reason. Uh, the woman who's there at the NLRB, that's the reason. Look, there, people can vote for whoever they want to vote for. I think there are there are perfectly reasonable critiques of Joe Biden from many different ideological perspectives. Um, but I don't find the argument that the economy is bad because he's rigged it against working people to be in any way compelling. There you go. I think that is 180 degrees the opposite of what has actually happened. That is that is right on. And for me, uh, he found Obama's comfortable shoes and actually walked a picket line. So for me, that, that again, another another step forward. But Zachary, I appreciate you taking some time for us. Great piece. You want to check out Zachary's work. Slate.com is where you can find that. His most recent piece, the U.S. economy's rebound since COVID is kind of incredible. Why doesn't anyone seem to realize this? Uh, Slate.com's Zachary Carter. Zach, thanks for taking time for us. Thanks so much for having me, Rick. Want to hear your thoughts? Email me, Rick, at the RickSmithShow.com. Should Biden be getting more credit for uh, what I think is kind of amazing? Uh, let me know. I want to hear. Rick at the RickSmithShow.com. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1917. That was the day that Montana Republican Jeanette Rankin was sworn in as the first ever woman elected to the U.S. Congress. Her mother was a school teacher and her father was a rancher. On her victory, Representative Rankin said, I may be the first woman member of Congress, but I won't be the last. Rankin was dedicated to the causes of women's suffrage and improving social welfare, especially for women and children. She was also a staunch pacifist. She was one of only 50 representatives who voted against the United States' entry into World War I. Her stance cost her politically. After one term in the House, she ran for the Senate but lost. Losing her place in Washington did not slow Rankin down, however. She became the field secretary for the National Consumers League, a post she held for three years. Working from the famed Hull House, she traveled around the Midwest speaking for women's rights and workers' rights. She lobbied state legislators to support minimum wage laws and to reduce the long hours required of many workers. She was a major advocate for the child labor amendment. This proposed amendment to the U.S. Constitution would have required Congress to regulate all labor by children under the age of 18. 28 states ratified the amendment but it never reached approval by three-fourths of the states required to amend the Constitution. In 1941, Rankin returned to Congress. There, she continued her dedication to pacifism, where after the attack on Pearl Harbor, she cast the only no vote on the U.S. entry into World War II. The very unpopular vote effectively ended her political career. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Check out our website, thericksmithshow.com. So yesterday, uh, we had on the program a homeless advocate and my personal friend, Pat LaMarche, uh, talking about the uh, Grants Pass versus Johnson case. And, you know, while there were a lot of nice people saying a lot of nice things and making positive suggestions on what we can do and what we should be doing to end homelessness. Wow, some downright mean-spirited spirited, and some just, just angry, almost jealous, if you will. And look, the stereotypical view, um, the homeless are lazy, unmotivated, they don't want to work. Uh, some said they were responsible for their own situations. They made bad decisions. 
their poor personal failings, not just economic, but one person actually, it was a moral thing, made it a religious thing. This was God's punishment, which was weird to me, especially given the backdrop of the Easter holiday. Uh, some made the economic issue of, you know, they're a burden on society, draining our resources and how we should be uh, making criminal. We should be criminalizing homelessness because they're dangerous. You know, they're criminals. They should be taken away from decent society, which, again, I come back to could be any one of us at, at any time. But the main theme that ran through all of the angry, mean spirited, just downright ridiculous uh, comments this idea that they should just pull themselves up by their bootstraps. They could, they should just solve their own problems. They don't need help, which I, uh, wow. And, and sadly, I mean, you know, their views oversimplify and fail to consider the, the myriad of complex factors that contribute to this. Healthcare bills, um, car repairs, which I found, you know, Shocking that that is like the number one reason that people give for for being homeless. Uh, the car broke down, didn't have money to get it fixed, end up losing the job, end up losing the, the place where you live, got nowhere to go. And now, boom, you are on the streets with no resources. Health care right there as well. But, you know, basic economic hardship, money, jobs, this this the number one reason people are homeless. Now look, there are mental illness and substance abuse. Uh, there is part of that. But at the end of it, man, it, it comes down to some simple stuff. Stuff that we we could, if we wanted to, we could we could help fix. We could create more affordable housing. We could deal with the sy systemic issues like poverty and, and mass inequality. We could do some of this. And, and I guess it's the negative that I spent most of my time focused on because it, it's angering to me. Uh, that we could be show, so short-sighted until it happens to us. Now, I do want to, you know, give tip my hat off to Barbara, who sent me a very long, uh, long email uh, walking me through her ongoing struggles with homelessness uh, for for decades. Uh, you know, again, someone who was you know working, trying to trying to make ends meet, trying to make that next step, trying to lead a better life, only to have one bit of crisis after another just throw you back and it's 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 heartbreaking and we should and could do better stacy sent me a nice long email say, talking about her five years of volunteering in downtown san diego and how things are getting worse and not only worse in these tent encampments where people are, are forced to find refuge but with the people who are doing very well being angry at the fact that there are there are people with money in this area that could help. And, and for me, this is another one of those things where government has to act. One of those reasons that I'm such a big believer in government action. Doing those things collectively that we cannot do individually. I personally cannot end homelessness. Jeff Bezos could. Elon Musk most certainly could. There are billionaires in this country who could, in fact, end this immediately and have a legacy of being that person that ended homelessness. They're not going to, but they could. And this is why we, as a sane, a civil society of rational voters, could vote for people who say, you know what, we do need more affordable housing. We do need to invest heavily in getting not just homeless people places to stay, but everyone uh, a place to live. Stable housing is is a key part of a stable society. And understand, you know, when you have stable housing, you can then deal with all of those other things. You can then have those supportive services like mental health care, substance abuse, job training, all those things. You could then begin that. But first, you got to put a roof over their heads. They got to know where they're going to lay their head at the end of the day. And then we can start talking about all of those other things. And then prevention, ensuring that, you know what, when, when you have a $400 car repair, maybe having somewhere where, I don't know, poor people aren't at the mercy of, I don't know, payday lenders who are going to try and charge them hundreds of percent interest on a short-term loan, maybe have some way of, oh, I don't know, maybe some religious group 
could start a, a car repair service. I don't know, but there's got to be a way forward. And you could probably fund some of that with public dollars on the short term, spending a little bit of money so that in the long term, you don't have to spend a lot of money. And then you don't have a lot of societal problems. And then we could do all of those other things. Educate, employ. You know, to me, the number one way to ensure that we don't have a homeless population, good union jobs. Give people a job that they can go and earn a, a decent living and put a roof over there. That sounds, sounds like a way forward. But ultimately, this is going to take a long-term commitment. There are no silver bullets. Ending homelessness, long-term commitment, requires sustained commitment, re requires resources, and all of us. Again, this is not something that one person generally can take care of, and it's something that we all have to want to end. And I keep saying, this is the reason I support government action. This is the reason that I think collectively we can do, we can do this. We can do good things. I want to hear your thoughts. And thank you for the folks who sent me emails uh, on this issue and, and everything else as well. If you want to email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. I do answer all emails personally and, and great grateful for your, your input. Uh, if you miss any portion of the program, make sure you grab the podcast. Wherever you find your favorite podcast, you'll find ours. And as always, thanks so much for being here. We'll see you back here next time. You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show. Email Rick, Email Rick. at rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Until next time, this has been The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk.